I think we are live now. Look at that. What a great bunch of people. What a great gang. A lot of cool people and cool stuff to talk about. I'm going to introduce everybody. Ron Sobel, who's actually a, a returning guest of mine. The Randy Rhodes Quiet Riot Years documentary and book. Fabulous. The best kept secret in Excellent. music. The best kept documentary in the music industry just before somebody said what there's a randy rhodes documentary i go yeah there it is go pick it up go buy it mark weiss oh boy i'm gonna put up your book right now you won't see it on your side the decade that rocked the decade that rocked i know you have a copy of it somewhere there right in back of you yeah, right here. boom look at that it's behind me too up on my shelf no but it is for my copy still <laughs> you didn't, Ron, you didn't get yours? I'm and, writing it down right now. And a new oh, member to the so gang, cool. Missy, Missy Whitney. Uh, Hello. Kevin Dubrow and Quiet Right keep on rolling the new book that's going to be released. It's on pre-order right now. And I'm showing your book actually on the screen. You can't see it, but it's there, okay? Lots to talk about today. Um, the first thing I want to tell everybody about is... How did you first meet Kevin? Before we get into everything, I just want to know the different sort of eras or the different time periods so everybody could kind of get an idea of who met Kevin first and who met him last or whenever the case may be. I'll let Ron start off. Well, that's because I met him first. <laughs> yes, exactly. <clears throat> it was like September 1972. How did I you- I was going to Valley College. I've told this story many times. And my brother, was a grade younger than me, 12th grade at Grand High School, and he had met Kevin, and he comes home, my brother comes home, who else, my brother also happens to be Stan Lee, the guitarist for the Dickies. Yep. Uh, pretty popular punk band, still going strong. Anyways, he says, there's this guy named Kevin that's really into Humble Pie like you are. Uh, you want to meet him? I said, sure. Gave me Kevin's number. Try to make a long story short. It's not really that long a story. Call up Kevin. He says, yeah, come on over. Bring your stuff. My, bring my photographs and things like that. I go over to his house. He's got this tiny bedroom that he's sharing with his brother. It's like the bedroom, I don't know, it couldn't have been more than 100 square feet. Is that a lot for a bed? I don't know. Anyways, um, his pictures, he had pictures because he, he was a photographer too. I had just basically started out. I had a really crummy camera. So my pictures weren't very good and Kevin's were like so much better than mine. And I just went, well, okay, I guess he doesn't want to take any of my stuff, but we kind of developed this little bond with, uh, through humble pie. And Kevin was, he was really a super fan. He was mailing people in England and trading like American clippings from magazines. Uh, with people in, in England, and he taught me how to do this pen pal thing where I got records, I got photographs, I got all sorts of stuff from England, and I traded uh, stuff that I had cut out from like Circus Magazine. Maybe some of your pictures went to England, Mark. And uh, that's kind of what happened. I, I, when I left Kevin's, I didn't think I'd hear from him again, but he called me up and said, hey, what are you doing? Let's go hang out. And from that on, we were, you know, it took a little while to become best friends, but eventually that's what we became. Very, very cool. Missy, you're next. Um, you know, I saw Quiet Riot play near the very tail end. My first show was August 30th, 1979. As far as meeting Kevin, um, I met him sometime in 80 after Randy uh, went to Ozzy. And it actually started out as pen pounds. I was terribly shy. So I found his address in the phone book and he lived in an apartment and I sent him letters and I sent him copies of photographs that I took of Debro shows. And there was a lot. So I used to send it to him and then one day he wrote back. So I was pen pals first and um, he sent me discount tickets and then he started sending me more discount tickets and asked for my help to spread the word. And then one time um, he actually called the house. I lived at home, I was a teenager. And um, when I got on the phone, I didn't know who it was us and so he started singing slick black cadillac and i just went oh <laughs> it was so cool i finally talked to him on the phone and then after that um i had a debro shirt made because there was you know no merchandise back then and i wore it to the starwood one night and so he knew it was me 
And so he went and he was at sound check. He walked over to me in the parking lot and he introduced himself in person. And I actually have a photo of that very first meeting in the book. Yeah. So it was kind of a gradual pen pal thing. Very, very cool. Mark? Oh, uh, well, the first time I saw or, or found out about Quiet Riot was at the US Festival. I was there shooting for Ozzy and uh, and there was, uh, you know, Quiet Riot was one of the opening opening acts. Uh, impressed by him, you know, I, I, I think I might have said hi to him backstage, but that was about it. So then my next time, uh, my real meeting was when they played the Madison Square Garden opening up for Black Sabbath, uh, yeah. I think in like October. And it was an assignment for Faces Magazine. It's like a new rock mag. And we wanted to do like backstage stuff and, you know, a little more like Rolling Stone style photographs. And uh, we want to do something with Quiet Riot. And I think Frankie uh, kind of took advantage of the situation because they needed a single seat for Bang Your Head. And they knew I was coming in there and he knew about me and all that. So, you know, he said, you know, their manager said, make sure you, you tell Mark to bring like a, a, a a empty camp to, a canvas so and bring some paint mm -hmm. so uh, i followed instructions and i figured he was going to do something i didn't know what and uh after the sh i don't know if it was after i think it was before during the after sound check uh he just started going to town on it and we ended up with this this uh single sleep yeah the famous picture uh, there. yep and you know and then we became friends and i did other photos and uh, the slideshow really, to my youth. The slideshow to my youth. Mark Weiss. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> Come out and shoot at Kevin's house in Rossmore Street. Yeah. So then we became friends, and then anytime I, uh, you know, I went on the road with them. I did photos. He got him in the magazine. So of course, I'm their buddy. I get him in all these rock mags, circus, hit parade, or faces, and uh, overseas mags. And uh, you know, I just was one of those another band on my roster that I would. When they went on tour and they had a new album out or a video, I would make sure I was there. And we became, you know, friends. And uh, and, and then Kevin invited me to stay at his house at Ross Moore. Uh, he gave me keys. He's like, whenever I needed a place to stay, whether it was there or he wasn't there. And, you know, we hung out, you know, did everything guys do in the 80s, you know, <laughs> had, you know, <laughs> women over <laughs> You know, we partied a little bit or a lot, and uh, and we, you know, that was my beginning of my relationship, uh, which right. uh, continued throughout the decades. All right, so now the book. This is, and I think I heard Rudy Sarzo say this. This is the missing link between Randy Rhodes era Quiet Riot and Metal Health Quiet Riot. This is sort of like the Debro era, right? The sort of the cultivating. Debro era that sort of created that metal health era. Missy, right. you, you want to talk about the book and how you got Mark and Ron involved? Oh, well, I can't take credit for Ron. Um, Mark got him involved, by the way. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Ron. Yeah, <laughs> Both yeah. of their names were on the cover because that's huge to have, have the two main photographers of the band. So that, that really made me very happy. Um, I've been wanting to do this book for a long time. But as everyone knows, life gets in the way. Jobs, commute, and it just, it just never got around to it. I had pieces of it done. And then when Kevin died, I just really didn't want to do it anymore because I was just so upset. And um, 2020 comes around and everyone's stuck at home. And one day I went out on a walk. I said, this is the year. This is the year I'm going to do it. I can work on it every single day. And so I sat down and I put on a 80 station, this needed a quiet ride and rat and Cinderella and whatever came on just to get me in the mood. Went through all my memorabilia and started trying to remember all the memories I wanted to share. Um, at one point I knew I wanted a really great book cover. I have photos of Debro mm -hmm. and they're, they're decent, but there are no Ron Sobel and there are no Mark. No. And um, <laughs> but I thought, you know what, maybe I'll try to find one online. So I was looking around for a specific uh, photo. I was looking for a photo of Kevin where you could see clearly the little gold charm necklace of his microphone stand. Um, and I had given that to him uh, for his birthday right before they went on stage to perform a solid gold uh, TV show. And so I saw this photo shoot where he's wearing leopard and black and he was all bound and gagged with rope and so I thought okay well let me see who did this and I look Mark Weiss no idea who he is I'm so bad at keeping in touch I find out Mark's the man <laughs> and 
I think it was a good thing I didn't know because I never would have picked up the phone. I've been way too intimidated. So I loved that photo and I thought, okay, I'm going to ask him, but I don't have money for this. And I know he's big time and he's on album covers and everything. I thought, well, I'll just go ahead and send him a quick note. And if I don't hear from him, at least I gave it a shot. And then um, actually he wrote back, which I was surprised. And he wrote and I wrote back. He kept asking me questions. And so I finally just picked up the phone because I'm uh, I'm on the West Coast. He's on the East Coast. And um, we talked and he's asked me a bunch of questions. And he said, let me let me think about, about this. I, 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 have an, I have an idea. So I went back to working on my book. I was just going to put it out on Kindle. I was going to keep it very low key. And then about a month later, because Mark launched his book and he was busy, busy, busy. And all of a sudden he contacted me and said, look, I have a great idea for this book. Why don't we put some of my photos, not just the cover, and let's get a hold of Ron and see if he'll also contribute right. some photos. So Missy, let's go to Mark. What did you think? I want to hear Mark say on this. Oh. Yeah, you're please. paraphrasing. You're paraphrasing here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait a second. Mark's right there. Oh, we right. can make this interactive. <laughs> He's probably wants to know my point Mark, of view, okay, right? Okay, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna toss the ball to you, Mark. Okay, okay. Missy sends you an email. What's the first thing that comes to your head? Well, I just you know I, I'm gonna you know I figured it's a sale. I didn't know you know if she was self publishing or what the deal was, but you know when I told her my prices, she says, "Oh, thanks anyway." I'm like, "Well, wait a minute, you know, it's, um, let, let me know more about what you're doing." That's when I started asking the questions, yeah. uh, and then and then she told me who she was, and I said, "Can you send me?" your manuscript and she sent it to me and I read it and I fell in love with it. I thought it was very uh, heartwarming and I knew Kevin and a lot of people don't know Kevin as he is. And, well, that's and, what I want to hear. It was heartwarming. I like that word. Okay, go ahead. Well, you know, Kevin, you know, had a big mouth, but that's, that's him. You know, he, even if he just was working as a janitor, he had that same mouth. That's it's his DNA and he just speaks his mind and he's, he's proud of it. And, some some rock stars and people don't take great to it. Um, I got along with it. I I gave him. I always like uh, gave him credit for speaking his mind, and he, we made fun. And that that uh, image that Missy was talking about, we tied him up with rope with a gag in his mouth. And Spencer, the um, one of the shots we had Spencer like you know hanging him with the noose, you know. So Spencer we were, Proffer, we were playing right, with it, you know. Yeah. And he had a sense of humor. That's why I liked him, and he. Uh, and I, you know, Kevin was always on your side. If he was, uh, if he was your friend, he would have your back. Okay. And I'd have back how, how did you bring Ron into the picture now? So Ron, you know, you, you tell me when Mark contacts you, I, what did you think? Oh, Hey, you know what? This is about time. Somebody did something about Kevin. I mean, what were you thinking? <laughs> you want some photos, some photos? No problem. <laughs> That's I know all. I thought about it. I wanted to read it. I, I actually said, can I fact check it? And I never got a copy to fact check yet. <laughs> well, to, to be fair, honestly, um, I think until you read the book and the manuscript, you don't really realize this is not about this happened this date, this happened this date, et cetera. It's more about, um, it comes from more of an um, emotional period, like, we couldn't get into a particular club. We were underage. So the next night we decided to sneak in. Um, it's about fan stories. You know, someone showing up at the PO box, not realizing it wasn't a physical fan club. So it's really not anything more than my personal experiences working with Kevin, working with Frankie, how I met Frankie. Um, and so that's why it's more, it's more along the lines of, that's why I say my fan club years. Because it's more about you know, how I work. Yeah, I get that. This is ba basically social media before there was social media, right? That's what the Correct. fan clubs did. And I guess the kids of today don't understand that, right? And it's not their fault. There yeah. was no Facebook and Twitter. You couldn't get the word out. So, Missy, just tell me about how important the fan club was for bands back in the day. Honestly, it was a, the only connection the fans had with the band. Unless you were a photographer or you knew the band or you were their girlfriend or, you know, whatever. That's it. You, you know, you couldn't get backstage. Now, if you're a groupie, possibly, you know, all that is, is a given. But true fans that weren't any of the above, they had no connection to the, to the band. And I found that at first I had an unofficial list of people because I was a fan and I was a little younger than the group. And I didn't really know any of them. So I went out and I made my own Dubro fan list. And so I would go to the forum with some friends. I dragged all my friends with me. They, they had no choice. <laughs> yeah. And we'd go to the forum and some Scorpions or somebody would be playing. We'd sit in the car. We'd wait for everybody to go inside. 
And we get out with my little handmade photocopy Dubrow Rocks mailing list flyers and put them all over the cars. So I made an unofficial list first before I even met Kevin. Everything was still by mail. And then when mental health came out, that's when it got really bad and scary <laughs> because the mail was pouring in. My sister and I would but, go to the But I want you to pause. I want you to pause right there. Hold that thought, okay? <laughs> now, Ron, Debro. A lot of people, it's just sort of like, what was Debro? I mean, a lot of people don't understand what Debro was. And people don't realize that it was actually, what was it, like 100 shows he played? I mean, it was at least, what, a year? Two years where he was going under that name? It's a piece of history that no one really knows about. And Ron, you were there, right? I, I was mean, there doing lights. Uh, I took a few promo pictures for Dubro that had Chuck Wright and Bob Steffen and Frankie in the band. I think the first guitar player Kevin got was Greg Leon. Yes. Um, and then there were a few others. I think Mitch Perry played with him. Mm -hmm. Mitch does uh, Ro the rotating now. musicians, rotating musicians, right? Yeah, yeah he kind of had rotating guitar players. And I was going to USC film school at the time, so I would do the lights. But as far as like all the social stuff and who Kevin had in and out, I don't remember much about it. Um, I really don't even remember when Carlos joined the band. I, I was just reading something online where it said, uh, they got the record deal, and then they got Carlos, but I don't know if that's right. Maybe Missy knows. You know what? It's funny you should say that, because Revolving Musicians, one week it was one guy, there was five people in the band, and there was four. And then Greg Leon is gone, and now it's Mitch Perry. Now it's Gary Van Dyke on bass, it's Chuck Wright. I actually never got to know hardly any of them, because they were coming and going so fast. So I just stuck with Kevin until Frankie got in the band, because Frankie was so solid, and he actually met me introduce himself so that's how i knew frankie a lot better than the rest of the guys mark have you ever heard of dubro like other than the la scene oh, no same here I, like yeah. same here like i was i was looking for these albums right i, I wasn't looking for dubro i was looking for, i couldn't find them back in the day you know when randy rhodes was popular with ozzy but mark you've never heard dubro the name oh. it was more of an la thing correct missy it is in fact that's just the whole point when when Randy left and then eventually Rudy, Kevin told me I'm going to name the band Dubro so I can call all the shots. And he seemed very happy with that. And that's when he started trying to fine tune who the lineup was going to be. So when they got the record deal, and this is what Kevin told me, he said that they thought it'd be better to use the name Quiet Riot again. So it it really wasn't a way is Dubro. The Quiet Riot that the world knows under mental health is Dubro. And a lot of the songs are written by Kevin too. You know, you know what's interesting? So I'm just going to throw out your thoughts here. When I was a young guy and I, Randy Rhodes passed away tragically, the first thing I wanted to gravitate towards was anything quite right. I was looking for the imports, right? And instead of the imports, I found this album, right? Before it actually went popular, right? Mental Health. And now to your point, the songs, right? Uh, one song, Bang Your Head, came from the snow era with Carlos, right? Another song, and maybe Ron remembers this more than anyone. And then there was another song I think Carlos wrote. Oh boy, which one was it? Uh, Don't Want to Let You Go. Most of those songs they did in the Dubrow set. What? Slick Black Cadillac was from obviously Quiet Riot with Randy. This is right. what I'm trying to understand. If Dubrow got signed, how did they get signed? Where, where Quiet Riot couldn't get signed, how did Dubrow get signed? They had a producer that came along, Spencer Proffer. He saw Dubro play and he thought Kevin sounded like Naughty Holder. And he thought he could do something with this band. And he signed him. Then he told him he wanted him to do Come Feel the Noise. And they refused. But of course, he was the producer, so he kind of made them. Kevin told Frankie, okay, you're going to do the drum track. I want you to mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie's playing the drum track and Kevin's through the glass of the door to the recording studio trying to get Frankie to make a mistake. He's making faces and things like that. Frankie finishes the track. Kevin goes, what are you doing? You're supposed to mess it up. Frankie goes, I can't. It's not in my DNA. Yeah. 
And then the rest is history with that song. Yeah. So, so Missy, Dubro gets signed, I guess, based on what Ron said, right? They had the right songs, the right producer, the right timing. Yeah. And then they switched to name. I would think that if they never switched a name to Quiet Riot, I would have never purchased this album, right? I don't really even know why they went back to that name. I, Ron, maybe you might know this more than I do, but I, I, I kind of recall Kevin telling me that after Randy died, and this is what it kind of went to bro, record deal, going to change the name to Quiet Riot, Randy dies, and then Kevin said Randy was supposed to come back and play under the name Quiet Riot with the record deal. And he was supposed to play on the song, right? On, on Thunderbird. Yeah, so that, that's what my understanding of the timeline was, because Kevin said uh, what makes it more disappointing and upsetting that Randy's gone is that he was going to rejoin the band. So that never happened. Yeah. And um, well, He wasn't going to so, rejoin the band. He was going to play like on one of the tracks. Okay, I could have sworn he said he was, maybe he maybe he was hopeful he'd rejoin the band. <laughs> I, I think it would. Look, there's absolutely Kevin loved. There was a relationship there, right, Ron? Kevin and, and Missy. Kevin loved Randy like to no end, right? I've interviewed uh, Kelly Garney, and uh, there was a division, right? There was everybody was fighting for Randy's attention. Randy Rhodes, you know, Kelly wanted to grab him, and Kevin wanted to grab him, and then the whole fighting and the gun incidents. And then Kelly was out, and then Kevin finally got Randy, and then Randy left. Mark, as a person, and now I just want to talk about the person who Kevin was. What kind of person was he? Like we said, heartwarming, funny, outrageous. I mean, what, what kind of person was Kevin to you? Sarcastic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, he liked his women. Uh, uh, that's I don't know. I don't know what else. To <laughs> it's like, well, did, did he make I, friends easily? Because let me tell you, I've interviewed Kelly Rhodes, and he said, you know, he didn't make friends. Like he was really rude to people, but he loved what he did. Like he wanted to be a rock star. He was, he persevered. You know, he no matter what, no one's gonna stop him. He was he was committed. Maybe that's what the word is. Yeah, I mean, overnight success. <laughs> if he liked you, then you were. Kept uh, I mean, I brought, you know, more his his persona into the magazine, so he befriended me. You know, he, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm sure he liked me as a person, not just, you know, because I can get him in magazines. I mean, I took good photos, and he liked them, and and then he sees him in the magazine, so it goes both ways. You know, it's it's uh it's a relationship that a photographer wants to get from an artist that's especially starting to sell millions of records uh and getting the access so uh i liked his personality uh like i remember going to uh the rainbow and you know piercy or you know don or docking or they would say where you, where are you staying like you know what hotel are you staying i say i'm staying at kevin's and they were like really why are you staying there i'm like you know why not you know he's my buddy you know it's uh he's like oh, you gotta tell him to chill out on it if you you know listen it, it it was good press everyone fed into it uh and it was just kevin being kevin yeah missy what was your his personality like to you and i just i want to establish sort of like a character you know that's why you know what um uh, i think one of the one of the big reasons why um kevin and i got along well is because we were very businesslike I'm a very business-like person, and mm -hmm. so was he. And since we had the exact same goal, we worked beautifully together. And I think most of it started as we're working together. Get the word out, you know, update on this. It's, it was very fun. If I wanted something done, he was on it. If he needed something done for me, I was on it. But as time went on, we became friends. It's almost like that had to be the catalyst to then becoming friends. And you know, he'd come up for Christmas. He'd give me a little Christmas, little demo tape wrapped up in Christmas paper. Um, he would just do kind things and little things. And I think part of that is because, I mean, I didn't ask for things. I just wanted to help. And as time went on, he realized that I wasn't out to get something from him. And I think that makes the difference when he becomes loyal. He realizes you're there, and you're not there to, you know, I want all backstage. I want free. I want whatever. I paid for all my tickets. 
I did all of that. It's like, this guy is trying to make it and I have no doubt and, he's and going your, to. And your name is um, on, on the back of the album, right? Your name? Um, it is, and on the original pressing, that's that obviously it's the original pressing. Yeah. Uh, Kevin was actually very thrilled to call and tell me that my name was on there twice. And he really wanted me to understand that you're on there twice. You're the Quiet Rise Squad, and you're right after Ron Sobel, my best friend. Do you realize what that means? <laughs> no, I'm totally grateful. Thank you. But he was really railing it in that that um, there's only a handful of people who were thanked and I was right there next to his best friend. And he was always very clear, as much as he loved Randy to death, in my communications with him, Ron's his best friend. He says, Ron's always been there no, for me. Ron. And uh, <laughs> not, and you remember I was sitting at his table in his little apartment and he says, you know, Randy's great, Randy's great. And he's fluffing his hair and everything. He says, but Ron Solo has always been there for me. And he doesn't get enough credit for being my best friend. And I think that's the whole thing is that he has a tendency to go out there and meet a ton of people and I'm sure it's got, you know, more popular, they met even more, but like with Mark, Mark started off, you know, doing photography, but it was the Mark, the person that Kevin gave the keys to, to come stay at his house anytime he wanted to, because he got to know Mark and he was a solid and, and true guy. So Kevin would keep his guard up until he knew that you weren't somebody who was going to, you know, offend him or backstab him or do something. That seemed to be his mentality. And then once that was established, that's it for life. He was there for you for life. I always like. I always wished I could interview Kevin. Unfortunately, I didn't. I, I thought he. I, I always thought I loved his character. Even when I was a kid and he was mouthing off, I just loved his character. I just loved that sort of attitude. I don't know. I gravitate towards. I like Mark. I just. I, I prefer people who are more outspoken than people who are quiet. You know, uh, Ron. Uh, you've told me so many times, but just quickly, you know, what are the things that stand out about his character that you just loved? Uh, well, I thought it was cool. He kind of made the overture to like be friends with me, fight then me be friends with him. That meant a lot to me before I even kind of knew what was going on. Um, Kevin, if you were his friend, he had your back. He had mine many times. He was, if somebody was like trying to get his goat or something, he was so quick witted. You just couldn't get it over on him. Um, he got me to get out of my house. I was living with my parents. I was 25, <laughs> still living with my parents. He says, "Hey, if you, I don't. Some of you might know who Kim McNair is. I mean, I know you two do. All three of you probably. Um, Kim was living with Kevin in an apartment, and then Kim moved out, and Kevin needed a roommate. He goes, "You got to move in with me. You got to get out of your parents' house." <laughs> nah, I'm kind of comfortable here. I'm still going to school, and you know, he goes, "Come on, we'll have so much fun. There'll be so many girls." I go. Okay. <laughs> That's always the motivator, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so um, it was a motivator, and yes, I did meet a lot of girls. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Uh, Missy, um, now the book. I know I, I want to talk about, you know, establish his character, who he was, because I think, you know, he gets lost between, you know, with Randy Rhodes, he's always getting lost. But, I mean, he was the driver of Quiet Riot. I mean, when I heard the original version of uh, Snow, Bang Your Head, the riff is there, but only Kevin took it to the next level and made it a real song. Is it, I mean, he was a musician. And he wasn't even a born musician, right? Right, Ronnie kind of just fell into, I'm going to be a singer, right? Are you asking me? Well, I guess I'm asking you both. Well, because I, I was just thinking... <laughs> well, I, heard, I heard Ron... I heard Ron while you were talking about that, I remember, I don't know where I saw this, but somebody in some interview somewhere said that Kevin was on the phone with Randy when Randy was in England and Randy was telling Kevin about these kids banging their heads. He called them, you know, Kevin hadn't heard that term before, but head bangers. And right after that, Kevin wrote the lyrics to bang your head. Yeah. Yeah. Missy. Okay. So quick, quick synopsis of the book so why should people pre-order this it's on indiegogo right now right it's um it's still being funded correct how do, what's going on we already completed the first phase we, we raised over uh 50 in uh, less than two months which was really great and um so now we want to just do the last bit um, do all the pre-orders and then we go to press because the book is pretty much done. It's just a matter of, you know, getting the funds. So it, it's not going to be what we're going to write it. it. It's been written. It's been edited. The photos have been chosen. Uh, we're just now going to get the layout done and then do the book. Um, as far as 
why, first of all, the, the big thing is the Dubrow period, like, like you said. I find it interesting whenever I come across a Quiet Riot fan, they, they either don't know about the Randy years, depending on where they're coming from and how old they are, or they know about mental health. Um, but when they find out that there was a period where Kevin played 107 shows as Dubrow and was looking, going through musicians and trying to find the right chemistry and writing a ton of songs and had that singular drive to make it, um, that era there, I was side by side as far as helping him promote the band. And so I was not someone that you hired, hi, hello, corporate person, please do the fan club. It's, no, I'm a massive fan of the music. I'm the ideal candidate. And when he got the record deal, he called and asked me to meet him at the Troubadour in the bar area. And um, I insisted on, you know, what do you need? Do I have to go to the Troubadour? He says, no, you got to come down here. So I called some friends because I went everywhere with, with friends. That's what you did back then. That was your social media. You dragged your friends everywhere and went down to the Troubadour and Kevin saw me walk in and he grabbed my arm and pulled me over to a booth and sat me down and said, Spencer Proffer loves the music and he wants to sign us. And I'm, we were just both like, giddy. And it's interesting because- It's like you made Kevin, it, right? It's like you made he, it too, right? Yes, he knew that it was just important to me and I'm sure to all his friends. But you know, you can only be so, so you have to be a certain way with your guy friends. Everything has to be cool. Everything has to be hit. But here he's all, you know, he might as well been a, a teenage fan himself because he was so excited. And then he said, there's more, there's more. And I'm like, okay. He said, I want to make you the official fan club president. He says, you've been doing it unofficially. And now that we have a deal, I want you to be there. And I need you to help me with this because we're going to be huge. And I know there's going to be a lot of fans. And I know you're going to connect with them because you're a fan too. So that's really, it's to bro up to that point, being a fan, sharing, getting the name out. And my experience is working with Kevin before he was huge, meeting Frankie before he was big. I met him when he was in Monarch. And then the album comes out and then it's how that explodes. It's getting fans down to the mental health video shoot. Um, it's going to the feel the noise video shoot. And I was pretty, pretty much there for the beginning few albums. Um, okay. And, you know, you start getting older, you start going into twenties, you start having a life and getting married. And unless you're someone's girlfriend or wife, you kind of, I did my part, you know, yeah. I was there to launch it and I was there to give birth, if you will. Yeah. And then that was, pretty much my era, but it was the strongest and the coolest era of all. In my <laughs> there you go. That, that's, was... that's true. Mark, August 1983, you get called to do the photo shoot at uh, Us Festival. I think it was in August, August 83, right? The mm -hmm. band in October, I think. October? Mm -hmm. Us Festival? I don't remember Memorial, exactly. Memorial Day or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Mark, you well, get called. I mean, how Mark, popular Mark, was, right. this is before Metal Health and Come On Feel The Noise actually was a big hit. The band played at 11 a.m., something like that, right? Mm -hmm. What was no, sort of, sorry? Metal Health, they were actually on the road by promoting acts. So Metal Health was out. No, no, but, but the videos, the videos weren't sort of like singles yet. They weren't like hits. It was sort of like the band was picking up steam, but they weren't sort of up there yet. Right, exactly. Yeah. What was the sort of like, do you remember the fans and were they gravitating towards the band? What, what was the sort of like the mood like? Yeah, they... I mean, they played, I mean, musicians, I mean, they were like, they played flawlessly during that show and with the energy and, and excitement, they, they put on a rock show in, in the morning. Uh, Motley, I, I think Motley was before. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. And uh, and there was like 250,000 kids there and they loved them. Uh, and uh, Kevin was just the rock star. I mean, they were all rock stars up there. You know, Carlos went on his shoulders you know, Frankie was a, an animal up there and Rudy was just doing his posing and slapping the bass. It was just an incredible performance. Uh, I, I think they really stole the show. Uh, and uh, I think the Scorpions followed him and then Ozzy, uh, uh, kind of ironic on, 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 on the day, I was there for Ozzy. Uh, and, uh, and it was the first time I set eyes on, on Quiet Riot. Did you know their music before doing no, the photography? No, I never heard of Quiet Riot. Never heard of him. And Ron, were you there? I was there. There's so a... give us a little backstage kind of uh, feeling what was there. And Missy, I don't know if you were there, but Ron, tell me about what was going on backstage. The throwing up before the show. I don't know. Well, I was their lighting guy, but there's no lighting. There's a morning. And they didn't need lights to go on in the daytime. And we were back east when they got the call to, they got the gig because John Cougar Mellencamp dropped out. 
So it was like last minute and I can't remember exactly if I was supposed to sell t-shirts or take pictures, but I got to go. None of the other crew, uh, the sound guy came. Nobody else came, but me and the sound guy in the band. I don't even think any roadies came. Um, so there's a video that's out or a DVD that's out of the Quiet Riot um, Us Festival show and you yeah. can see me in it. Oh yeah, cool. <laughs> but anyways, it's like after that, they started to get their first uh, support act on a big arena tour was for Loverboy. Yeah. So we were opening for Loverboy and they were blowing Loverboy off the stage. <laughs> Loverboy kicked them off the tour. <laughs> Canadian Love band. And, and just to plug this one more time. So before Missy's era, it was Ron's era. This is Randy Rhodes' A Quiet Riot year. So sort of the beginning of Quiet Riot. Uh, you know, all the sort of uh, characters and the members and the artists and the people behind the scenes appear in this documentary. The best kept secret or the best kept documentary in the music industry right here. So go Thank you. do yourself a favor, pick it up. I've seen it like five, six times. I'm a huge Randy Rhodes fan. And the book, and the book is amazing too. And the I mean. book is amazing too. Yes, yes, yes. And your book too. And your book too, Mark. Your book too oh, is great. Yes. And, and yes, Ron's book, it accompanied, do you have your book there, Ron? Do you have your book what? that accompanies it? Is it what? The book that comes with the DVD. Do you have it in front of you? There it is. So there's a little guy. Oh, here's here. the, you can get it at redmatchproductions.com or ronsobel.com. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, I am overjoyed that I have two heavy hitters on this book because my stories are lovely, but with their photos, it's turned it into just a masterpiece. So I mean, thank I, mean you I, I didn't. I didn't want it to be a little paperback, you know, soft cover. Those don't really do it. It's going to be that, Mark. It's going to be a Kindle. <laughs> yeah, it, it deserved more. And uh, I want it to be a hard cover. I want it to be glossy. I want it to look like my book. Not as big. I mean, mine's 400 pages uh, and, and a coffee table. But it's going to have the same look and feel of it and just have it so it's on everyone's shelves that people want to know about it and then when I called Ron up, he's like, you know, sure. I told him it wasn't a lot of money. You know, we, he, he worked with us and, uh, you know, we're going to uh, self-publish it. And, it's, you know, I've learned a lot by uh, by working with the publishing uh, company that I'm with now about my book. Uh, and uh, I'm going to see where we can go with it. And uh, uh, yeah, no, I think it's, you know, that's the way you do it today. Right? That's just the way you do it today. And, and it works. Yeah. Mark. Small world story about Missy and my book. Missy's ex-husband was the graphic designer, Danny Anderson, on my book. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay, there's he's a lot also, of connections. He's also, he was also my, you know, back when you're young, you make up fancy titles. I called him my VP <laughs> uh, president because I met him on one of those flyers that I stuck on the forum and he called me and he said, look, I can do graphic design. I work at a mailing house and uh, I had a vision for that the poster you put up, that yellow quiet right wants you. And he helped me design that because that was the membership form for fans to join the member the, the fan club back then. So I went down to um, an army recruiting store, I got a poster, and then I took the poster and we found a way to put the metal wow. mask on the front of it. And then we put quiet right wants you. That was my vision. I wanted on yellow and boom. So he actually designed that for me too. So Denny and I are still great friends. <laughs> he's, he's very talented. Whose idea was it for the metal mask anyways? Oh no, do you know the one? Was the um the, the album cover designer. Oh yeah, that's that was yeah. But that's actually yeah. him on the cover. That's the artist. Took a picture of himself. He got that red um I'm not sure if it was red or if he to painted me it. It always red. looks like Kevin. Yeah. It always looked like Kevin there. That's Kevin. Yeah, that's Kevin, right? But M Missy has a story about uh, the video shoot when they made the original uh, one that she talks about in the book. I thought it was kind of interesting. Go ahead. Where is that? And, and you and you have it, right? Oh, the metal mask. Yeah, I have the the one that's the one that you see on the, the shelf behind me. Um, that you can you can just buy that. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. One. Uh, that's what it looks like on the album cover, but. At the time of the video shoot, the college, the Cal Arts College, where they filmed it, they had the students of the art college make the, the um, masks for us. And we were supposed to wear them at the very end. And, and then it showed as if, as if mental health made us all turn into these you know, mental patients with the masks. <laughs> After the, the video shoot was over, 
we were supposed to walk out of the auditorium and hand back our masks. And the goody two shoes that I was, I handed mine in, but my sister didn't. So we have one left from that video shoot. And there's a, I'm actually using it in uh, my little photo that you posted earlier. That's mm -hmm. the real metal mask from that video shoot. Very cool. I think it's a one of a kind. I don't think there's any more. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's very cool. Mark, I want to ask you this. So <clears throat> I think it's the end of metal health. Kevin mouths off, right? He sort of, he sees all the other bands getting signed. You know, he thinks he's in a lousy deal with uh, with Spencer, right? You know, he thinks that Spencer Proffer took more than he should have. And he lashes out in the press. Not once, but multiple times. I remember buying these magazines. What was the journalistic sort of community thinking about this? What were, what were the thoughts of the journalistic community at the time? Like, oh my God, it's Kevin. Oh my God. Were they anxious to get more quotes for him? Did they want to ruin his career? I mean, what was... Well, they, Missy, they and then I want to ask you, Missy, didn't you tell him to like to stop? Stop, please, just stop now. Mark, Mark, feel Mark free to answer first. Well, he, he liked it, you know? I mean, he and the journalists liked it. It was like a love-love a relationship because it's not... Like, he wasn't pissed that they wrote it because he said it. He stands behind everything he ever said. Uh, and more, you know? He's like... Uh, you know, he turned regular rock mags into like the star magazine, you know, and like TMZ before there was TMZ. Yeah. Uh, he, he loved it. Uh, did it help sell records? I don't know. Probably. Uh, you know, you get in the press, people talk about you, you know, people love you. They hate you at the end of the day. If they'll buy the record, if they like the music. Did he and, piss and journalists then, off? Did he rub them the wrong way? Perhaps. I, I don't think he pissed journalists off. He just pissed, pissed band members off. Okay. Band yeah. off. All right, okay. He rubbed the fans the wrong way. It was kind of like, they pretty much kind of went downhill after that. And Kevin admits it, you know, later on. Yeah, and, and did anybody actually tell him, Kevin, can you just please, just just a little calmer, you know, not, not as specific no, or- nobody could, tell Kevin, nobody could tell Kevin anything. No. Nope. Don't no, no, tell Kevin anything. So, so there was uh, no- uh, Point but it was it, it was it was public. I mean, you know, in one you know, in the magazines, it was like they come out every month, so it, it takes a month to get there. But it, it travels, so these little feuds would go on for months. Not like if it was today, it would be on Twitter <laughs> and Facebook, and then two days later, they'd be they'd be gone. These lingered, so these things yeah. lingered, uh, and then someone else would do an interview, and then a month later would appear in a magazine, and that's how it was. It just kind of kept going. It, was, yeah. it wasn't forgotten about. Yeah, I guess what people forget is like magazines, what had like a two month lead time before the, the story was actually published to the time of the interview or something like that, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, well, not only that, but you know what's interesting is that before Kevin made it big and the whole band, that was who Kevin was. He had opinions about everything. I actually found that really refreshing. Everyone's so PC, it's kind of boring. Yeah, you I never agree. Really know what they think. So when Kevin was being Kevin, now it's being amplified and now he's getting a bunch of crap for it. And obviously like Ron said, he kind of regrets it, but he didn't realize he had to restrain who Kevin was. And like Ron said, you don't tell Kevin what to do. I never would. In fact, most of the time, if you would complain about them giving him that kind of coverage, I'd say, too bad. That's how you feel. There you go. Because he has an opinion. It's refreshing. Ron, so. When when okay, first of all, the album went number one, right? The album in I, I don't know if it was November. I can't remember November eighty three. November was one, right? Yes, it went number one. And then I mean, when you're number one, where else can you go, right? But down. It probably would have been better if they had a slow rise yeah. instead of that explosion to the top. But <laughs> what, what was the do. downfall? What was the downfall? And I remember I was actually I, I was happy when. Kevin was coming out with these quotes. I was laughing. I love the opinionated sort of, like you said, the anti-PC sort of uh, spokesman. I loved it. I got a kick out of it, but the majority of the people didn't, right? Do you think that was the one of the reasons why everything started going down or was it because they didn't build slowly? Uh, probably one of the things is not building slowly. I mean, Relatively speaking, from when the record came out, I think it was in March to November. I don't know if you'd call that slow to number one, but nobody would have expected it to go to number one. I, it's probably, look, it's Kevin's mouth. Most people would have to say it was Kevin's mouth. And the second record wasn't as good as the first. And another big mistake was doing um, Mama, We're All Crazy Now. 
people would make, you know, they get a lot of back backlash that, oh, they have to do another Soleil song as a single. That didn't help at all. What about him? And I've seen him in interviews. He starts, you know, palling around too much and getting on everybody's nerves and Rudy Sarzo leaves. Was the drugs now a part of it? Did the drugs start <laughs> playing a role and, and sort of yes. amplifying I, I his, like amplifying his character? This, you, I don't like talking about the drugs, but since you okay. brought it up. All right. No, no, no. I mean, look, you don't have to. You don't have to. No, no. It's, he he spoke about COVID. it. I mean, I, I could read quotes I, about I, it, right? I, yeah. I, I, okay. Well, Kevin was, he was, you know, out there. <laughs> So he took it a little too far, too much partying and thinking he was immortal and we're number one and everybody loves us. I can do whatever I want. It, 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 he can't. Yeah. He started pissing off people that had influence over record buyers. And I know, okay, this story I hate to tell, but I'm going to tell it because I don't think I've ever gone public with it. Nice. But... <laughs> Since uh, it is part of the, the fall, I think, um, Kevin would have me make a bunch of iced tea and put it in the Jack Daniels bottle. This was public in People Magazine because the I didn't realize it. That was the writer from People Magazine was in the dressing room when I was making the tea to put in the Jack Daniels bottle. And what does she do? She writes about it. And guess who finds out about that? David Lee Roth. And what does David Lee Roth do? When they're on stage for the 1984 tour, he holds his bottle of Jack Daniels up and goes, this ain't no quiet riot. Oh. You know, so that didn't help either. No. And again, I'm not, I'm not like, I mean, it's a public that, you know, I mean, he talked about it. He goes, I didn't do as much drugs as David Lee Roth did, but I did do drugs. I mean, he said that, you know, in many interviews. Missy, what's your, if you want to comment, you can comment. If you don't want to comment, that's cool too. Honestly, I was spared. Um, I, th I believe during the time, I mean, I'm not sure what he was doing when we were working together, but he was very clear headed and he took care of business. And I could have sworn one time I heard him say he didn't really start getting involved with drugs till he was like 28. And I knew him before that. So I knew the clear headed business focus, we're going to get a record deal guy. And um, he also knows that, and it's true to this day, I don't drink. I don't smoke. <laughs> what do you do at a man song? I don't do any of that stuff. It just never occurred to me. So I think if he was doing anything, even if it was a small amount, he kept it from me. He, he, I may have put him on a pedestal as the singer and I worked for him, but he put me on a pedestal as I'm not going to ruin her innocence with yeah. the other side of my life. And that's exactly how the relationship was. I heard about it later on. There was some stuff with Frankie that he, he was worried about Kevin, which that was a documentary that, that's well known. And then um, when he died, it was it was still pretty much a shock because I still had him kind of in that place where he's not going to take it that far, is he? But by then I was married. I moved on. I did my part. And so I really wasn't in the the weeds of it. I wasn't, you know, um, watching him do this. And I'm actually quite grateful because I got to see, in my opinion, the Another side. Kevin that. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, the, the sweetness of Kevin and the kindness of Kevin. How about and, you, Mark? So okay, you're backstage. That's I, was. I wasn't there for the rest of it. Mark was backstage. Yeah. He was back of everything that was going on there. I mean, did you sort of see that, sense that, see, you know, man, this is a little too hyper for me, or I, or maybe you just were so happy back then you didn't even care? Yeah, I was happy and I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, I had fun with Kevin. I just, I was not an abuser, you know, I yeah. liked everything Kevin liked, but I just knew when to do it and when not to. And when, you know, and I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it's not in my DNA to mouth off. So it's like, it, you know, cocaine accentuates what you like to do. You know, I mean, it made me a little more chattier, which I liked because I'm a quiet guy. So, you know, it got me, it was easier to talk to girls when you're doing it, you know, and, and, you know, you get a little creative, I guess. You feel you are anyway. And so I, I you know, I partook in, in it uh, as a, a recreational drug, you know, and I didn't abuse it. Uh, Kevin took it too far, like, you know, Ron said. And, and the reason why I bring it up, I'll tell you why I bring it up, because that sort of like was the end game for him, right? That was that was sort of like his demise, right? At the end of the day, it was, it was you know, the drugs. And it's... And I, 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 like I said, this is a kind of music, this is an artist that I've always wanted to interview. Like, I think it'd be one of the greatest interviews ever. I just, I, I you know, I, I just always wanted to meet Kevin Dubrow. That's all. Um, 
Oh, you know what, uh, Jimmy, I want to say one thing too about sure, the book sure. as far as, um, in the very beginning of the introduction, I put in there, sex, drugs, and rock and roll minus the sex and the drugs. That's what this book is about. It was about the rock and roll and in the fan side. So if anyone's wondering, it's not going to be the usual, well, I got drunk and I did this or, you know, I, I was like having that. sex. Not going to be that at all. It really is yeah. from a, a fan, pure fan who ended up being the head of a fan club and understood the rest of the fans. And like, like Mark has said before, it's kind of pure and innocent. And because that's really the story that hasn't really been told. It's just more about nice. that. It's, you know, there's plenty of books out there on the CD side of life. Just go to a rock and roll band. They'll tell you all about it. This is a little bit of a different angle and because it's from my perspective. Well, that's what, it, that's what I, I want to hear. That's what I want to hear. You know, I want to hear the other side. For so many years, we heard that one sort of dark side. I want to hear the good yeah. stuff, you know? And, and it's, it's not even an angle. It's just Missy's story. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's not made up. It's just there. It's, she's got notes going back and forth. It's it's her recollections. Obviously, you can hear it like she remembers everything. Uh, and so it's it needs and to And I be love the guys. There's nothing bad about the guys in the book because I've had pure love and respect for all of them. And that's how they will always be in my mind. And they're, yeah, the letters that Mark talked about, I did put in the uh, handful of letters that Kevin wrote to me on his little stationery said, I thought I'd drop you a lion. And it's a little lion on the side of the stationery. So I have his letters telling me who's in the band and what's going on. So I love having those letters. That's, that's again, something that social media doesn't provide anymore. You know, it's amazing. Uh, there, I, I talked about Kelly Garney and Randy Rhodes always together. And then Kevin sort of jealous of that sort of relationship. And he wanted Randy for himself. Right, Ron? Am I wrong about this? No, you're right. But <laughs> so Randy tragically passes the sad passing of Randy Rhodes. And what happens in, in and I spoke to Kelly about this is he develops this relationship with Kelly after hating him for so many years. They sort of become mm -hmm. friends. And, 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 it, and I find that, I don't know, it's kind of like they've come full circle and they've bonded over the tragedy of randy right and 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 they were friends up until he died and i thought that was very touching a lot of letters are going back and forth between kelly and uh and and, and kevin and i i don't know i thought ron did you hear about that or i'm sure you know about that right well kevin moved to las vegas and kelly was living in las vegas so that's kind of part of the reason he became friends with them again because there was somebody there that he knew because later on, it started going, like at the very end, it started going south, um, as far as I was told. Now, if Kelly watches this and wants to um, defend himself, that's fine. But that's what I was told and what I saw with Kevin. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I mean, when I spoke to Kelly, and I'm not... But I'm that's, not, not you know, him. that was at the very end. It wasn't like they didn't have a good time. You know, Kevin trusted Kelly. He gave him the keys to his house when he yes. was out of town to take care of things. So, All right. Also, Jimmy, Jimmy, also, Kevin's just a jealous person. He didn't like me seeing other bands. <laughs> 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 so when I told him I saw Monarch. Boy, I got an earload for seeing Monarch. But then when I said the drum was phenomenal, and then, then Frankie got his band a few weeks later, and he was all thrilled to death because I'm sure he heard about it from other people. And then now his number one fan and also thinks Frank is great and then boom but yeah no he the first thing I said was I, I went and saw a band called Monarch and I was a little nervous about saying that because I'm you know I only saw his his band he said why why are you seeing another band and he was joking on the phone but Kevin was very particular he wants your loyalty if you're my number one fan then that's your your job and it was kind of a funny thing but he, he can be very jealous in that way too so I think that's part of his personality yeah, that's a pretty cool you had a hand in Frankie joining would you say you that? Know, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, Ron. <laughs> From my memory, um, we were at the Starwood because Monarch opened for Quiet Right three nights in a row. And I think on the second or third night, Frankie walked over with discount tickets, you know, all dressed down. We were always standing in line early. We were front. We'd get there two hours ahead of time. We wanted to be in the front. And I refused to be anywhere at the front he walked over and i said to my my friends i said that's the drummer from monarch because i recognized him from the nights before and frank comes over introduces himself he says do you have discount tickets and we're like oh yeah we already do he says well i'm really impressed that you guys come and you see kevin and right up front i'm really impressed with that he says, would you consider coming to see my band monarch and i said i'm like well, we'll think about it because so again i had a feeling that kevin wouldn't approve and he said we're playing at a place called flippers 
that roller rink place with a band on the side. So I gathered my friends and we snuck to flippers <laughs> and we watched him play. And Frankie was pointing his drumstick and smiling. He was so happy that we made it, but he was so good. So I, I took, a, took a leap and I called Kevin. I said, I went to go see a band Monarch. Why? Why are you seeing another band? And then I said, well, the drummer, Frankie Benelli, is just phenomenal. He's got this big sound. And I think it was a week, maybe two weeks, he called up, guess who's my band now? Guess who's the new drummer? Guess who's my band now? And I said, oh, this is Frankie Benelli, Frankie Benelli. He's not always talking. He always has this quick little spurts of talking. And I went, really? And he said, yeah, yeah. But then I, I saw later on that Randy told him about him. So, I mean, who knows? I think my timing was beautiful because it seemed like I influenced, but, you know, I'm not going to take that kind of credit. <laughs> You know, I, I like that. It's, it's you know, same with me. I mean, when I'm growing up, you know, I used to go see bands like you did and you never knew if they're going to become big or not, right? And there's this innocence to it all. And I, I'll, I'll tell you something else. In LA, it was probably 21 years old to go to bars, right? Yes. I, I would assume, right? Here it's 18. So, I mean, we were like going at 16 to bars and oh. watching bands. So, like, you, you're talking about innocent and naive, you know, there we were, right? Um, what about Frankie? Like, I mean, you, you, that was a great story. Mark, what was it like for you know, taking pictures of Frankie. What was he like? Was it, was he easy to work with? Well, uh, he was protective over Kevin and the band. Uh, uh, he knew Kevin liked me. Uh, I think Fra Frankie liked me. Uh, otherwise he wouldn't like let me do the, all these photo shoots. But, uh, you know, he's very business. You know, he was very business. He wasn't, he wasn't really super warm. Uh, but he was business and and straight and just to the point. And that was our relationship over the decades, really. Um, uh, smart guy, amazing track record. I mean, when I found out recently what he's done and how, where he came from, yeah. again, like, I didn't know what he did. And, like, I mean, these these guys are rock warriors, and they paid their dues. It's like uh, – and it ends up being in the perfect storm with the perfect band with the perfect songs. And, and you got this perfect drummer that just added what quiet riot needed. It was the perfect drummer for quiet riot. I mean, who knows if, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure quiet riot would have become big, uh, but he just, uh, was the cement and just, he was the guy. Look, that drum pattern for Come On, Feel the Noise, right? That That is, that's what we think of when we think of uh, Come On, Feel the Noise. It's that intro drum, that beat. Uh, I've talked to Frankie a lot of times, and it's exactly like you said. He's business, but when he loves you, he loves you. He will He will hold on to you. He's very loyal. And, uh, you know, it's very sad that he passed. Ron, your, your, your feelings on Frankie or comments or... Um, <laughs> well... To tell you the truth, Frankie was kind of um, jealous a little bit because of my relationship with Kevin, because I knew him for so long before, and it was like, oh, this guy's playing, doing our lights. He's just Kevin's friend. You know, I get that a lot, so I had to prove myself, which I did with my 1200 light, 1200 light light show, <laughs> which lasted about a day because it cost too much, but they didn't know it at the time. Um, and actually that's one of the reasons I got fired from doing the lights and Frankie was a little behind that, but I got over it and actually them firing me was the best thing that could have happened to me because I ended up making way much more money doing real estate than I would have if I was, you know, so, so just to backtrack a little bit, the, the band comes off the road for mental health. They go on the road for condition critical and massive lights, right? Is that what it Between was? Metal, well, after Metal Health, they said, okay, we want you to make us the biggest light show you, you can. So, so they asked they you. Asked they asked you. That. They asked you. They asked me, and I did it. But then it had to start getting cut down because all the Kevin backlash was starting, and maybe they had um, played and toured too much before they came out with their second album. So the tickets weren't selling, so we had to cut the light show down. Um, so actually for actually so i got fired before the third record came out and i was pretty pissed about it and so for like a year i wasn't friends with kevin but then they kicked kevin out of the band so, <laughs> how you do that i don't know so your enemy is your again. friend okay yeah. kevin kevin starts up then then kevin gets back together with frankie they start quiet riot again 
I actually executive produced the record down to the bone, um, which is a bonus. If you buy my book, <laughs> you get that as a bonus. <laughs> so did I, did I forget that, to mention the I, DVD? <laughs> thank you. After that, Kevin and I push marks too. <laughs> I don't have his book, but Mark, uh, you can hold. After, actually, I have a picture of his book. <laughs> and, and you guys won't see it, but boom, there you go. The decade got rocked. That's like the commercial. So after, that's like the commercial in between the chat. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ron. Anyway, after that, Frankie and I, um, after Kevin passed, we became a lot better friends. Uh, he kept Quiet Riot going. I went to the very first LA. I didn't go to the very first renewed Quiet Riot show without Kevin, but I went to the first one they had like locally at the Canyon Club. Um, and I kind of, you know, we came way better friends with Frankie then, but we could never quite, he kept telling me, come on over to the house, I'll cook you pasta, but I never quite got there. And unfortunately he passed. Yeah. And uh, Missy, when did you leave? When's, what, like what era, what time period, the third album, the second album, when did you leave? Well, the, the, the Quiet Ride fan club got really big after mental health. That was when it was just like, you know, overflowing. And I work with Warren Edner, their manager a lot. And um, I told him the fans really wanted a fan club. They wanted merchandise. And, and he said, okay, well, why don't you put something together? So I did. I went and did like um, prototypes of things I would want as a fan and put it together and then made that membership form quite right, want you. And I was going to charge $10 a package. Now, at the time, Warren said, mm, I don't think you're going to get anyone to pay $10 a package. I said, you don't read the letters like I do. He says, I'll tell you what, put it out there. You know, email the membership forms. If you get a hundred in the next month, we'll put everything in production, all the stuff you designed, and we'll go from there. I said, great. So we put it together, the merchandise thing, and sent it off. Mm -hmm. And uh, a month goes by. I made an appointment to go back and see him. And I sat there across from his uh, desk in his home office, and I couldn't wait for him to get off the phone because I was busting out the seams. And he said, you didn't get a hundred, did you? I said, no, you were right. I go, you got 400. <laughs> <laughs> and I plopped out checks, big old envelope of checks written by, by parents for their kids and everybody and just mass amount. Now it was all payable to quiet riot squad, which was a non-existent entity at the time. Oh. Warren said, we'll open an account, deposit the checks. We'll, we'll take care of it. And then after that, it just got put on hold. Quiet riot was getting so big. I don't think Warren could, now deal with a fan club branch so it took about six months and and people were really kind but they were writing going did you get my money you know do you know when it's going to happen and i i kind of got depressed because you know i'm like kevin i want to get this stuff done and i kept leaving messages from warren and finally says look at this is what we're going to do because it's such a big success we're going to get a fan club company that will make the merchandise and ship it. And all you have to do is write the, the monthly newsletters because you you have a rapport with the fans mm -hmm. and we're going to fulfill it that way. I said, great, you know, because I was like 1920, I was pretty young. And so that's what we were going to do. But then that kind of fell through. And to this day, I don't know why. I don't know whether they decided to just go with tour merchandise and they didn't want to do this anymore. There was like one or two letters that they rubber stamped my name on saying, hey, here's your checks back. You know, they're stale dated and we're going to go ahead and we're going to start all fresh here again. And, um, and it just disappeared. So by the time like the second album came and, and all that, there really wasn't much for me to do anymore. There was no fan club really to run anymore. Um, Kevin went from his apartment to a house in Hollywood Hills. I went there a lot. But once he moved to Rossmore, I kind of, and that's where Mark came in. I never even went to his house in Rossmore, and we were just kind of keeping in touch here and there. Um, and he was on the road more. Everyone had their new friends and their girlfriends and their lives, and I had mine. So I pretty much was there like a, a what you got, shooting star, you know, with the big. Well, you were the there at the best time. It. Yeah, yeah. The cultivating and of. Then after that, yeah. and I, didn't go to, I didn't go really to any of the shows later on um, again because you know, I, I had my own life and I felt kind of weird. It's like, unless you're married to somebody in the band or you've got some kind of official capacity, it started to feel strange to show up as a you know fan later in her years. And um, so when Kevin died, there was no way I could ever go see them with another singer. I feel the same way about Queen. I can't go see Queen. Well, um, I, think, I, 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 I think that's a good point right there. You know, I have a hard time. I, even when Frankie, when I interviewed him and he was coming out with these albums with all these singers and they're rotating singers, you know, 
quite right without Kevin is just not quite right, in my opinion. You know, I mean, to each his own, right? If people want to love the band, great. But it's just not the same. It's just not the same. And I told Frankie I supported what they were doing. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure on some level, he wondered why I didn't show up, even if just to say hi. But um, to be up, to be up front of the stage for 105 shows and not have it be Kevin, it would be too hard for me. Yeah, I agree. It'd it. be way too hard. All right. And you know, Frankie got me. Frankie got me through Kevin's death. He's the one who wrote to wow. me and said, Kevin thought about you and and reached out because I I lost my voice after uh, Kevin died. I literally lost my voice, and um, so I sent him an email and I said, I'm so angry that Kevin died. And he, he wrote back and he was, you know, he was, he just lost his best friend and his livelihood and he's consoling me. That's the kind of guy Frankie is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Ron, I wanted to do this Kevin Dubrow after we did the Randy Rhodes interview with you and your, 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 your documentary, I wanted to do something on Kevin. I think just timing wise, it just happened perfectly. I was telling you for a while and it's great that all you guys are here talking about Kevin one last question. A lot of people are asking about Randy Rhodes. Okay, Mark, you uh, took pictures of Randy back, and we're going back. We're backtracking a little bit because I know a lot of people are asking about this. And maybe everybody could just sort of weigh in on Randy Rhodes just to give everybody a little bit of glimpse more of Randy. Mark, you took pictures of Randy. I, I'm assuming it was Blizzard of Oz in the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. Just tell me what yeah. that experience was like. Well, I mean, unfortunately, I only photographed him uh, backstage one time. I did one photo shoot with Ozzy and, the, and Randy and uh, and Rudy and Tommy Aldridge. Uh, and it was at the Capitol Theater in Passaic. And it, sadly, that was the photo uh, Rolling Stone used hey, when he passed. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was a quick moment. It was right before the show. Uh, I liked him. You know, he was very quiet. Uh, and I shot him maybe a handful of times live. You know, I shot the whole show and, you know, did some things. But that's really it. I didn't really get to know him. Uh, I, I know, uh, you know, Kevin used to, when I used to stay at Kevin's house, he used to show me uh, postcards that he wrote, that Randy wrote to him when he was out with Ozzy, saying how he wished he was with, his, with him and, uh, you know, that he loved him. And, uh, you know, you know, we're going to get back together and do stuff and, you know, so I, he showed me those postcards. It was it was amazing when I stayed there. He just kept them in his drawers. I wish I would have took a picture of them or something. But you know, I respected his privacy and and left them there in the drawer. And uh, you know, and he shared them with me. And that's cool. So, so you know, for Kevin to feel that way about someone, he must be pretty special. You know, for someone that doesn't like too many people. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, aside from his talent, uh, I. I, I'm assuming uh, he was a special person. I'm sure Ron uh, knows him. Ron, uh, those and, are the uh, letters. Look at that. I've got um, some of the pictures. They're not in my book, though. This is the like a test copy of the book, and I had to take them out for legal wow. reasons. Wow. Wow. Okay, so, let's check my copy later, Ron. <laughs> so, Ron, what are what are those exactly? Are those handwritten letters, or what, what are Letters they? from Randy to Kevin. Uh, that place, you know, that's, yeah. that's like the Holy grail right there. <laughs> wow. So Ron, I got Ron, from Kevin's mom had them and she let me use them, but I couldn't put them in the book. Okay. All right. Um, you want to weigh in on that sort of Randy Rhodes and as a person and his relationship with Kevin. Kevin loved Randy. Like there was no tomorrow. Uh, he thought he was like a gift to himself. Like, how do how is it that I get to play with this with this guy? Um, he was pretty disappointed when Randy went to Ozzy, but he knew Quiet Riot really was kind of at a dead end, so Randy had to do it. Um, Randy was a great guy. He was really funny. Most people know this. That everybody always says this in interviews, at least that I've seen. He, he had his own sense of humor. A lot of it was kind of based on like the show Green Acres. <laughs> he, he liked a lot of his little words and, and special um, inside jokes or, you know, naming people or naming situations after things that happened on Green Acres. So it wasn't no bone movies, what, 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 no bone movies, right? Ron, no bone yeah. movies was an expression him and Kelly had, I think. Well, Bone Movies was a title, was what porn movies were called. They, that's what they called them. <laughs> that's <movies>. what they used to do. 
I, for, I don't know where this one came from. He would call people like, that guy's an Ed, but I forgot what the Ed was from. But it's from something on TV. I can't remember what. Maybe uh, Wilbur, uh, the, the horse show. Remember uh, Wilbur the pig? <laughs> no, the Wilbur, talking Wilbur, horse. Wilbur was the... The talking horse. Uh, talking Wilbur, horse. yeah. Uh, uh, Wilbur, uh, Mr. Ed. That's Mr. possible. Yeah. Um, there was Mr. Haney, I think, on uh, Green Acres and Arnold the pig. <laughs> so, anyways. <laughs> yeah. Or Missy, you want to just, you're, you're the Randy Rhodes, you're how you perceived him and how he was to you and how he was to Kevin. And I, I, one thing I do know from Kevin is reading a lot of interviews on him. He always said that Randy wanted to please everyone. He wanted to make everybody happy, right? He just, so that, that was a big part of it. Very character. different from Kevin, clearly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why opposites attract. Maybe. Actually, when I first saw Quiet Riot, um, I was a Randy fan. Like, who is it? You know? And uh, in fact, uh, right now in the Indiegogo campaign, there's a, um, a snippet from the book uh, that Mark is doing the layout right now. And um, there's a picture of me wearing a black and white polka dotted vest and bow tie that my mom made for me. I got photos of Randy and she had no pattern and she designed it so I can wear it to the show. Mm -hmm. And um, which I did. And um, um, I was like, 15, I think 15 or 16 at the time, and I'm all, you know, big eyed and excited. Um, the first time I saw him play at the Star Baby, I did stand right behind him after the set was over. Uh, I'm 5'9", and he's very petite. And um, someone bumped into his arm and spilled his drink on my skirt. He apologized. I was just like in heaven. <laughs> and that was my only interaction with Randy. And then I saw them in shows and took photos. Uh, when I did wear the polka dotted vest, however, um, because it was exactly like his, um, he actually, during a solo, came down, kneeled down on the stage and pointed to his cheek a few times until I understood he wanted me to give him a kiss on the cheek because I was wearing his exact outfit. And I did. And then he smiled and blushed like and got up and finished his solo. That's my interaction with Randy. So I'll always be the, one of the fans. Yeah. All right. On that note, I think we've pretty much covered everything. I look forward to your book and and to all. And of course, once again, the Randy Rhodes Quiet Riot Years, <laughs> right? <laughs> the DVD available online, Mark Wise. No, I haven't paid him to do that. <laughs> no, <laughs> the decade that rocked, that's incredible, incredible. By the way, Mark, I looked that over the other day and it's just incredible hey, pictures hey. and stories. Big picture. Look at that, look at that. Just that, that's just... Beautiful, beautiful. And of course, your book, and I'm going to put your book up here, Missy. Keep yeah, on rolling. Behind and, me, I've, well, got a, I've got an 8 by 10 of it behind me, but it's just, a, just an 8 by 10 that Mark provided. I have the picture up right now. People can actually see yeah. the picture right now in the book. And uh, that, was a, that was a photo Mark and I. He said, what photo do you want to use out of that photo shoot? And I said, the one where he's got his hands. Like, he's no angel kind of a thing. And Mark goes, great. That was the one I wanted to use, too. So Mark and I are on the same page when it comes to how this book is coming together. I couldn't ask for a better partner. So Mark, thank you, Mark. What'd you want to say? No, I just want everyone to go to Indiegogo because I, I want I want this book to be exactly how me and Missy foresee it. We don't want any outside corporate people like saying it's got to be this or that because you know, one of the things with my book, I needed the help, uh, but you know, certain pictures I wanted in and they said no. And you know, this is our to total vision. And I just, uh, we're just looking to raise a little bit more money so we can self publish it. And so I, I urge people to go to Indiegogo and you get things, you get photos, you get, you know, pics and the, the, the poster that Missy was talking about earlier, like, you know, and it's, and we're just talking, you know, five, $10, you know, for certain packages just to help out. And then, or, or you can like, you know, get a pre-order of the book and you get some goodies with it too. You know, I, I get. I apologize to everybody. There's, we got a full house here, so I can't get to all your texts. There's all these texts. People are just texting away, <laughs> and and I can't get to them all. Um, I appreciate everybody though watching, and I really want to do the show on Kevin to preserve his history, and I think it's really cool that you've done this book, and you've preserved his history because it's an important history in hard rock and heavy metal. It is. It truly Thanks, is. Thank all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you everybody for watching and thank Mark, you. always people, a pleasure, Mark. <laughs> and all the people who already bought packages. Thank you. I know you're out there watching. Yes. Yes. You've already Rod, sent me notes that you're watching. So thank you for watching. 
Thanks again, Ron. Thank you so much. Anytime. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. All right, guys. Have yourself a wonderful day. And you know what? Happy New Year. Yes, you Happy too. New Year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bye, right, everyone. Guys. Take care. <laughs>